Okay, Assalamualaikum. Can everyone hear me? Yes, clear, Doctor. Thank you, Lin. All right. Um, good morning to everyone and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, are there any more coming in? Or should I think I give another two minutes before we start? Okay, well, I uh, give one more minute. Dr. Harun is changing everyone into the room. <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning everyone uh, again. My name is Dr. Sharingas. I will be uh, your MC for today. Uh, thank you for coming over online and to, uh, to participate in our grooming workshop one. Uh, today we are delightful to have uh, Dr. Zai Omar who, uh, who was a winner of 2017 year Eurex Prize, uh, a national winner of Fem Lab Competition Malaysia. And uh, he, he is our first speaker for the whole uh, series of workshops and the first IEEE five minute final year project competition in 2020. Okay. So I hope everyone is ready. Uh, I will read through uh, Dr. Zai's um, biography a bit before we start. Um, Dr. Zai Bin Omar is a senior lecturer of the School of Electrical Engineering, UTM. Also a former uh, director of students at the Ministry of H Higher Education from 2018 to 2020. Dr. Zai completed his PhD at Imperial College London in 2012. And his master's degree uh, was from the University of Sheffield in 2008. Prior to that, Dr. Zai was an uh, engineer with a security consultant firm in Kuala Lumpur. He obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in computer engineering from UTM in 2006. Dr. Zai's uh, primary research interests are in image processing, medical imaging, and AI. He holds several research grants and has two collaboration with Malaysian, Malaysian IJN Institute Jantung Negara. Uh, he has published numerous work in the field and is currently providing uh, quite a number of postgraduate students. Other than that, uh, he maintains an active presence, being a winner of Fame Lab Malaysia and uh, at, at international level as well, uh, like you recognize Prize 2017, runner up for Study UK Alumni Award 2020, which is very recent, and has been a regular volunteer for Fame Lab activities since 2015. Uh, he was also the chair of IEEE Young Professionals Malaysia in 2017 and a current member of the Young Scientist Network YSNESM. After his fam lab wing doctor has appeared in numerous interviews on television and radio and has been facilitating science communication workshops in various parts of Malaysia. Dr. Zayed believes that engineers like himself can and should play a larger part in community STEM, uh, communicating STEM topic to the wider public in an interesting and meaningful way. Okay, um, that uh, the introduction for Dr. Kai Omar. I hope that actually buys some time for everyone to come in. Okay, I'll hand this over to Dr. Kai Omar. You are ready, right? You can share your screen now, Doctor. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Hello, yes. Can you share your screen? All right. 
All right. All right. Welcome, Dr. Gay Omar. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, can everyone see me? Uh, yes, we can see your slide. Okay, so you can see my slide, you can see my face as well, yes? Mm, I yes. have, yeah, should be. I, I can't see an awful lot. I can't see anyone's face. <laughs> Um, we just need to get you to the tool. <laughs> all right, okay, hold on. All right. Yeah, I'll need... Okay, so uh, everyone, you can see my face and you can also see the slides uh, in yeah. front of you, okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, um, so, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you to the organizers, uh, IEEE Young Professionals, for inviting me to share a bit of, um, you know, my knowledge and my skills in science communication. Um, first of all, I must uh, congratulate and welcome uh, all of the participants. Uh, I, I suppose you are the finalists of the IEEE uh, Five Minute uh, FYP competition. So congratulations on, um, you know, uh, participating. And I wish you all the best uh, in this competition. So um, I've been asked to basically um, share the tips and tricks and skills uh, and experiences of uh, basically what is called a science uh, communication. So over the course of this uh, session uh, this morning, I will be uh, sharing with you all, um, first of all, my background uh, and then my so, uh, idea of what science communication is and why is it important, and then we can move on to and uh, you know how to prepare science communication content. What are the things that you should do? What are the things that you should, you should avoid, and so on. And uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, uh, I'll maybe uh, talk a little bit about famous science communication competition. It's the world's largest and oldest uh, science communication. Uh, competition, uh, maybe in the hope of attracting you all to participate uh, in the coming years ahead. Uh, um, so is that okay? Is everyone okay to start right now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. It's because I cannot see the my, um, PowerPoint slide uh, in, in slide mode, so I cannot um, muscle anywhere else. Um, okay, so can you still can you still see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, you can still see the slides. Yes. Okay, that's fantastic. All right. All right. All right. I need to, I, I still need to move the slide. Anyway, um, all right, so let us begin. First of all, an introduction about myself. My name is Dr. Zaid Biboma. I hail from um, Johor Bahru, basically. I grew up in Johor Bahru, uh, but I was born in Perlis in August 1983. So I am 37 years old uh, this year. Um, here are some just uh, a list of uh, my experiences. I was the winner of uh, Fame Lab and Your Access Prize in 2017. Um, I was also actually the chair of IEEE Young Professionals. So I have worked with uh, Dr. Harun, the current chair. Uh, we worked together in IEEE Young Professionals, which was a very nice uh, memory, very nice experience that we experienced together. Um, when I was doing my PhD at Imperial, I was a khatib or the you know, uh, I gave sermons uh, every Friday. Um, I was also the president of the Malaysian Postgraduate Association when I was doing my PhD in the UK. Um, um, and I was the president of uh, Southern Alumni and uh, I'm very involved in an uh, NGO called Ikram. Uh, currently, I am a senior lecturer at uh, UTM uh, in Johor Bahru. A little bit about myself. Um, I come from uh, a family, my parents, 
were from the north. My dad is, was from Kedah, my mom is from Perlis. I am the second of four siblings. This is me when I was very small, uh, very cheeky, very knuckle boy uh, when I was growing up actually. Um, I remember I was around like four or five years old. Um, I was very, very nakala. I think these days you would call it, you would diagnose it as uh, ADHD uh, or hyperactive um, disorder, the hood. You know, so someone is very, very hyperactive. But in those days, in the 80s, you didn't really have that kind of um, diagnosis, that kind of um, uh, awareness about uh, medical conditions and so on. So they just treated me as a budak nakal and budak hyperactive. But I think uh, looking back, <laughs> I was probably a very hyperactive kid. Uh, back then, I would remember when I was four or five, um, I was so nakal in the car. Uh, my family was traveling to, my dad to beat me in the car. <laughs> and then uh, deliberately, because uh, he to beat me so hard uh, that I deliberately peed in the car. <laughs> but uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, now I'm an uh, adult, I'm a, I'm a uh, father and a husband as well. So <laughs> hopefully, my children is not too nakal. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, I had a very keen interest in computers, even from the start, uh, even from a uh, very, very young age. This was, this was when I was like uh, nine or ten years old. So back there, uh, this was during Hari Raya. Um, but even then, during Hari Raya, I, I even had the computer on and with all the computer games. So in those days, you had the, uh, apa? Um, the DOS, the, the DOS, so you had to write, you had to type the commands in order to play a game. So there's no windows that quickly to that there. So um, I, you know, I dabbled in computing and dabbled in um, coding and so on to even a very young age. So that sort of uh, piqued my interest in engineering and uh, AI and so on, even from young age. Uh, this is me in school. Um, this was Sekolah Rendah Agama Hidayah in Johor Bahru. It was a very modest, uh, very um, I guess underprivileged school juga lah. So we had dirt for, for the floors, you can see. Um, it was dirt and wooden uh, walls. Um, we, we had, you know, wood for, for the walls. So, um, but I think since then the school has grown leaps and bounds. And if you see the school now, uh, it's quite, uh, you know, one of the most um, uh, established schools in Johor Bahru uh, region. I'm from the Dark Kid. Hello, Dr. Kae. Hello. Uh, Hello, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, your slide is static. I think what you need to do is, um, would you like me to share yeah. the slide? No, I cannot share your slide. Uh, because you cannot see the slide when you are having only one monitor. Unless you have another monitor, then you can view your slide. Um, I'm not sure how, how to help you with your, your slide because your slide is not moving now. It's still at the title page. Hello? Uh -oh. Hello, uh, your voice is breaking. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, your voice is breaking. Um, uh, are you in the still on the title slide or you are in the next uh, few slides already? Oh my god. Hello. 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 The doctor have left the building. Oh my god. Okay. Building, eh? <laughs> Not the room. Hello, hello, hello. Doctor. Hello, yeah, you are breaking up, doctor. I'm still here. Okay. Um, we have a problem. Your slide shows only uh -huh. the title slide, not the rest of the slide. So we are not sure what heck Oh, yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think they tak boleh play slideshow kot. So I think I'll just um, in edit mode je lah. Macam ni. Um, hold on. You can share the screen. Okay. Okay, with, I think can lah. So, macam ni je lah kot eh. So if I move here, boleh nampak? 
Boleh, boleh, boleh. We can see the okay. movement of your mouth, yes. Ah, better. Okay, Dominic K, better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so can you see uh, the next slide, an introduction? Um, you are yet to click that. Eh? About? Uh, a bit slow, yeah. Uh, you can move, you get it? Eh, uh, kenapa eh? Uh, it doesn't change. How are you guys? A uh, little bit of glitch here. Uh, be patient. Okay, now we can see. Um, if I hold on. Um, if I move one more page. Yeah, now it's moving. Yeah, working now. Okay, all right. Okay. So, yeah, just um, let's uh, rewind a bit. So, an introduction about myself. So, this is me. Basically, I was... You know, I'm a senior lecturer um, focusing on image processing and artificial intelligence at UTM. Um, and basically, uh, here is a list of my um, uh, accomplishments, lah, right? Next slide. Um, actually, I have a few slides here, lah, a few pictures. Tapi let's just, um, because that's lovely, uh, so let's just have... Um, this latest, the, this the picture in front here. Uh, Doctor. Yeah. Doctor Zaid, can you hear me? Yeah. Assalamualaikum. Harun here. Okay, Doctor Zaid, yeah. if you are having trouble with your PPTs, maybe you can uh, share with uh, Doctor Shaz in private message on the Zoom, and then she can play your uh, slides. She can uh, move your slides. You can send her in a private message through using the chat box of Zoom. And uh, then she will be able to make it for you. Okay, so what I'll do is um, I will. Um, hold on. Um, I will send the file. I will send the file to Dr. Sharina. Yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's better. You can even send her WhatsApp or by a personal chat message. Anyway. The file is. Um, hold on. The file is quite big. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's over. <laughs> um, China, how, how, should, how should we do this? Mm. Will it be too big to be sent to the WhatsApp group? WhatsApp is too big. Okay. Um, give me your email, I'll, I'll email you. My email? Yeah. Um, Shahrinak, S H A H. Wait, I'll give you in the chat. Shahrinak. Uh, if you misspell my name, it goes somewhere else. Shahrinak. <laughs> uh, ah, uh, with a Z uh, at the back. S H A H R I N A Z at unikl dot edu dot my. I'll try to send you the file. It's 700 megs, so oh, um, okay. it's taking a while. All right. Sorry, everyone. Um, no, no worries, Doctor. No worries. Whilst we're waiting for this, um, can you maybe some of you introduce yourselves where you're from? You're all undergraduate students? Yes, doctor. Uh, yes. Sir. Which uh, universities are you from? Anyone from UTM? Raise your hand. Unikl. Unikl. Oh, okay. Unikl, sir. 
UTM ada je. Jadi UTM, UTM ada. Ni KL also se. Oh, ini KL ramai ah. Kebetulan. I see. Oh, uh, E engineering. Myself so guys kalau celuan. I triple E. Okay, fantastic. Make it funny, so right. So on uh, the ones in this, the audience here, uh, are they already participated in the uh, five minute FYP? Or are they just about to participate? They are about to participate, Doctor. Uh, we give so them... all of these are finalists? No, not yet. They are yet to submit their semi-final video. So we give them their workshop first so that they, they will know what to, like, you know, how to go about the presentation before their first submission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm not sure if I'm getting your email, sir. No, it's it's still loading. It's very long. It's taking a ah, long time. Okay. I think it's taking too long. Uh, yeah. Dr. Harun, do you have any other option for us? If it's not do, doing well. Uh, no, no, no yet, not yet. Email is taking too long. Oh, it's taking too long. Maybe I think because the file is a bit bigger, that's why maybe. Yeah, I know, but is there any other option? It's too big, it's too big. Uh, Dr. Zai can try using the chat box. Uh, in the email, um, you can to me, yeah. To you only, personally. He can click on your name in the chat box in message privately and then he can upload his file there. Let me try again. When you choose uh, your share screen, did you choose the... Uh... Uh, your the whole desktop, or you only choose choose the uh, PowerPoint because if you only choose PowerPoint, you cannot see everything else. Mm, you share your entire screen, right? Yeah, entire screen. Yeah. Oh. So it was your application window. Uh, so I should share my entire screen. Entire screen, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the first one, meaning that whatever you click, we can see really? whatever you yeah. By right, if you share only the PowerPoint, it, it only shows All the right, PowerPoint okay. without the slideshow. Yeah, never mind. We try this again. Eh? Okay. Ah, now I can see me. <laughs> okay. So, can you see the title slide here? Okay, just click on the title slide. Okay, so All can you see right. the title slide? Yeah, now you go for slideshow. Now I go for slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then go so to can you see? slide. Yeah. So, okay, okay. Yeah. Can you see, can you you. see an introduction? Yeah. Can everyone see an introduction with a picture of me and my family? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you, Doctor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You okay. can continue. <laughs> okay. All right. Right. So yeah, just uh, saying about growing up and picture of me and my computer and me at school. I was that very small kid, very dark, dark. Uh, so um, you know, uh, after I, I uh, went to sekolah uh, Hidayah uh, until form five, uh, where afterwards I um, got a place in UTM to study uh, computer engineering. So uh, um, from 2001 until 2006, uh, I was in UTM. So that's me on the left with my classmates. Uh, after graduating in uh, 2006, I worked at um, a security consultancy firm called IBS Technology. It was in uh, Waksamanju in KL. So we worked on uh, smart cards and access systems. So we, we programmed the chips and, and so on. Um, 
And then uh, I got a opportunity, a chance to further my studies. So I did my uh, masters at the University of Sheffield. And during my masters, uh, during the uh, one of the subjects uh, during the final semester, uh, it was a subject called visual information engineering, uh, where the lecturer there he introduced, uh, you know, the, the to me for for the first time the concept of image processing, and that was something that really appealed to me, and I began to fall in love, and that's why I decided to do my PhD in image processing. Uh, this time at Imperial College London. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is me during my PhD. My, my particular topic, my focus, uh, was on a technique called image fusion. So it's whereby you combine these two images from different modalities. Like for example, in medical, you have MRI, you have CT, you have ultrasound. So you combine them together in order to get a better information and better uh, image from that. So uh, after three and a half years, uh, Alhamdulillah, I passed my viva, uh, and that's my the topic of my uh, thesis lah. It's called signal processing algorithms for enhanced image fusion performance and assessment. So on the left is a picture of me with during the viva or well after the viva, and this machi, this very friendly machi over here in the um, hoodie, he's actually my supervisor. Dr. Tanya, so she and I are very close and she's very much much like lah. Um, so I have a lot uh, and indebted to her lah for a lot of my training and uh, experience. So now, uh, since then, uh, I was a lecturer and I am a lecturer uh, at UTM doing all the lecturing stuff lah. You know, supervising, teaching, research, a bit of uh, here and there as well. But from 2018 until 2020, uh, I was um, invited to lead the students, uh, holistic student division, ataupun bahagian mahasiswa holistic, basically uh, leading the HEP, lah, HEP department at the ministry. So it was a very nice um, experience, a very enriching experience, yeah, whereby I got to participate in policy making and got to participate in you know, developing our students uh, all around uh, Malaysia. So even during the COVID uh, time, I was involved in helping the students to uh, get back balik kampung, you know, the misi uh, IPT pulang and so on, uh, and uh, uh, other endeavors as well. So Alhamdulillah, uh, that has been a, a, you know, a really enriching. So let's talk science communication. All right, are you ready? Um, I am just going to show you what uh, my idea of science communication uh, is by showing, showing you uh, my own experience of communicating science. So this is a very short video that I'm going to play. Uh, tell me if there is a problem, okay? Uh, doctor, I think we can't hear the audio. Oh, tak dapat. Uh, volume tak boleh, tak boleh dengar eh? Ah, only the audio. The video we can see. Oh, audio tak nampak. Okay, hold on. What can I do? Um, 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 um. Let's try this. Uh, probably because you're, you, you're getting the hit cut. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I remove the headset, then the, um, okay. mm. the try audio it. will... Okay, I'll try this. Uh, the 2016 yeah. International Women's okay. is in his last day in office. And unlike then, they can not qualify to be re-elected. Yes, Dr. So, 2017, we looked at Zaid Omar match Abby's achievement. He's certainly going to try. Uh, Zaid's a senior lecturer at the University of Technology Malaysia looking into understanding the future through his work on computer vision and artificial intelligence. He's a big movie fan, so he knows his machines have a long way to go to catch up with the ones we see in sci-fi films. He's also, in his own words, a long-suffering supporter of Newcastle United, so he's used to failure as well as success. But, but last month, Newcastle were crowned champions uh, of the championship and are going back to the Premier League, so could that be a good Omar omen? Tough going first, so audience crank it up a bit. 
go crazier for Malaysia and the magpie mine of Dr. Zayed Omar. So this is my uh, experience uh, attending Kaimla International. We always take this for granted, but how do humans recognize faces? Well, in a way, the brain can be thought of as a very advanced computing machine. The brain receives input data from the eyes, in this case, a person's face. It then detects some important landmarks around the face, for example, skin color, eye color, size of nose and cheekbones. It then tries to match these landmarks to someone already in our brain database and finally produce an output. This face belongs to my daddy. My baby dogs, what can we say? But when you think about it, isn't the reverse also true? Isn't the computer really just a basic version of the brain? And therefore, can we program the computer to perform facial recognition just like humans? Well, yes, we can. In fact, yes, we already did. Facial recognition software was used to track down the persons responsible for the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013. And let's not forget your embarrassing photos on Facebook, courtesy of the photo tagging feature. <laughs> so facial recognition technology is very much part of our lives. But getting there is not easy. You see, the computer can perform basic tasks like multiplying huge numbers far better than humans. But when it comes to learning and intelligence, we are still miles ahead. So what sets us apart? What could be the X factor responsible for creating this intellect among the human race? Well, the answer lies in what is inside the brain. Billions of cells called neurons in the special way they interact among themselves in the network formation. And these neurons are what computer engineers are trying to emulate. This is called the neural network, a computer algorithm that takes inspiration from real neurons in our brain. And this is the real magic behind facial recognition technology. Guys, this is the epitome of super brain computing. Neural network is considered intelligent precisely because it mimics the human brain. A single neuron on the brain is pretty basic, but lots and lots of neurons connected together that allows for more advanced and complex processing to take place and achieve real artificial intelligence. Think of it like this. If I throw a pebble into a pond, it will create plain circular ripples on water. If I throw two pebbles together, when the ripples collide, a new shape will emerge, a V. Therefore, isn't it also plausible that if I throw a huge amount of pebbles in a specific way into the pond, I can make the ripples create a far more complex shape, like a picture of a house, for example. And that analogy is how computers utilize neural networks to perform facial recognition. These facial landmarks are like the pebbles that are fed into the network, where the ripples mix and mingle to finally produce an output. Match, crown, face, equals, Zayn, Omar. A neural network is so good, it's on par with even our ability to recognize faces. Neural network is the key to the future of artificial intelligence, and it all begins here. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, that was basically my attempt at science uh, communication. Boleh teruskan? Yes, Doctor. Continue. Uh, all right. Okay. So, um, science communication is basically, it's us, the scientists, the engineers, the ones with uh, knowledge, uh, trying to convey our ideas, trying to convey our concepts, the things that we know to those uh, wider public, to the ones yang uh, tak tahu, uh, to the ones yang um, akan tahu, uh, to those interested, to those uh, children, and so on. So how we uh, convey science, um, it's not a straightforward thing. It's not as, um, you know, something that you just, uh, you know, blink your eye and then uh, you just do it. There is actually a method to it. There's, there's actually a very, you know, a technique and a way to do it uh, properly that you have to consider. And I, I hope this uh, session this morning will be able to uh, share some of that uh, tips and tricks, okay? Okay, um, now let us consider as well why science communication and science is important. Let's begin in the future. Let's look at Malaysia in 2050 or 2090 or 2100. 
in 50 or 100 years time, what will Malaysia look like? What will our world uh, look like? Let's look at the, you know, the, the vast possibilities and opportunities that the future can afford to us. Flying cars, people living in, in the sky, you know, uh, fast moving teleportation, the potential of the brain um, unlocked, you know, uh, even with the biodiversity and uh, everything, all the, all the possible technologies that can, uh, that can happen uh, in the future as well. But these are the positive uh, opportunities, the positive possibilities that we can, um, you know, uh, imagine. But what about the negatives? Even if we look at the current world, not even in the future, it's a current point, we have so many challenges that we have to overcome even before we can even think about um, all those wonderful opportunities that we want to have in the future. We have climate change, conflicts, deforestation, energy crisis, biodiversity, overcrowdedness, overpopulation, pollution, poverty, health. All these are challenges and problems for us to solve. And more often than not, it is the job of the scientists and the engineers and the technologists for us to solve together. And for that, science is a real requirement to solve these problems. But if we know that you know, we want to achieve a, a very wonderful future, you know, a very idealistic, uh, utopian future. And we also know that we need to solve the problems that we have currently. But are we getting there? Are we moving in the right direction? Look at our status quo. So the government has put a very, um, you know, credible, a very sensible target of 60-40 ratio for science stream versus non-science stream students. But we are very far from achieving that. Only one in five secondary school Malaysians are doing science stream. Malaysia, we are targeting 500,000 scientists and engineers and 50,000 PhD holders by 2020, by this year, in fact. But we are far from reaching this target. We are spending 1.1% of our GDP on R&D as compared to 3% uh, from uh, other developed nations that are spending 3%. 3%. And, uh, uh, you know, in, way back in 2017, the ministry even slashed the deficit, uh, slashed the budget uh, of our R&D research for our universities. So, you know, with all this in mind, how can we even solve the uh, challenges that we are facing currently, let alone uh, going into the idealistic and utopian future that we want uh, in the future? So, at the end of the day, science is a challenge. Getting people interested, getting students to take science stream, getting you know, enough engineers and PhD holders is a challenge. And if you look at this scenario, this sums up our status very, very well. The teachers are teaching in front, but the students, they are not interested. The teaching are teaching science and you know, uh, science uh, subject, but the students, they are not interested. They would rather be doing something else. So where's the problem here? What's the problem in this picture, in this image? You can, you know, you can blame the students down there, but look at the teacher here. The problem is that science is not communicated effectively. Science is not communicated in a fun and meaningful way that makes the students down there interested enough and you know, realize uh, that science is important in their lives and they need science and they need to pursue science in order to help the nation uh, develop and grow and so on, right? So I'm going to uh, do a series of tests, uh, if I may, and I will audience, uh, all the participants to uh, undergo this test with me. So does society recognize the importance of science? I am going to show you a series of uh, pictures, of faces, and I want, to, I want you to guess, do you recognize these people, okay? Can we start? Can uh, somebody respond? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, who is this? Anyone want to uh, guess? Definitely not my uncle. Uh. <laughs> Unidentified. <laughs> it's not mine either. It's my uncle. 
I don't know who no. that is. No, but he's well, someone who is not in my database. No. He's, <laughs> he's someone who should be pretty famous because he's uh, done a lot of very important work. So this guy, his name is actually Kip Thorne, Professor Kip Thorne. And he was the recipient of a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in physics in 2017. And he, uh, on his work on gravitational waves, if you've ever heard about gravitational waves. Um, and if you've ever seen this uh, diagram, this picture here, have you seen this uh, picture? Does it remind you of a movie? Yeah. About Wormhole? Yeah. It's about it. Uh, it reminds you about interstellar. And Kit Thorne, he was actually the science consultant on Interstellar mm. to make sure that the science in that movie was actually correct. So Kit Thorne, he was, uh, you know, uh, you know, he was he was popular in in the academic domain, but also in the uh, popular culture pop culture domain as well. And even in the new movie Tenet by Christopher Nolan, he was also the science consultant in that movie as well. So the first of all, Kip Thorne. Secondly, anyone? Look familiar, I don't remember the name. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, let's, let's ask the, the young ones. Uh, young ones? Kim Kardashian and Kane West. Hey, hey. So Kim Ye. Uh, yes. so, so this one is senang lah, semua tahu lah. Okay, what about this one? Anyone? Clue Apple, Apple. Yeah, Isaac you? Newton. Isaac, Isaac Newton. Newton. Correct, correct. Yeah. What about this one? Uh, I think I know. Yeah, I look so nice. Uh, in the textbook. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Clue the sun, sun. The clue is Galileo. the sun. Galileo. Galileo, yes. Ah, Galileo. So he, was the one to, he was the one to prove that the earth revolved around the sun. Because during those times, the, the church believed that the earth is the center of the universe and everyone, everything else revolved around it. So he yes. was the one to prove them wrong. This one, ah, very interesting. Look at the logo in the computer. Microsoft Words. Uh, the logo behind it. CERN. Yes. Ah. Ah, so this is actually Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He is the inventor of the internet Ooh. and he invented the internet yeah. while he was working at CERN. CERN is the, um, the, what, the, the nuclear research uh, facility in Geneva in Switzerland. Okay, uh, this one? What? Local. Wait, what? <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> okay, ah, a bit harder, this one. Oh. So a Malaysian, very famous, very, his contribution towards knowledge in Malaysia is um, unparalleled. So he actually founded IJN, Institute Jantung Negara. His name is uh, Tan Sri Yahya Awang. Okay. okay, so he's a cardiologist. Uh, cardiologist. What about this one? He is a botanist, botanist Ali Poko, uh, an academician at University Malaya. His name is Professor Agustin, Agustin Ong. Uh, still, still uh, working hard lah. Still very, you know, um, uh, very active as a researcher and academician. This one, I'm sure you know him, the Malaysian Einstein. He's good with lasers. His field is in lasers. Also at University of Malaya. That Professor Harith Ahmad. Oh, what's the other one? Okay. Ah, this one. This one you don't know, so that's the Sarah. Of course. Okay. Uh, she looks familiar. Satellite, satellite. You don't know? I don't remember the name. <laughs> He was our um, director for Ankasa, so that Thomas Lan. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thomas, Thomas. Can hey, everyone, these yeah, yeah. Are our, <laughs> these are our rock stars. These are our superheroes, and we should know them. You know? Okay. We can know our Pazura. We know our Kanye West. 
but we also need to know these uh, people. So, um, you know, what makes a scientist in popular culture? Uh, scientists are always um, depicted as someone who is very nerdy, very geeky, muka pun ugly, pakai spek, mata jom, apa, gigi jongang, mata juling, very hodoh kan? But in actual fact, that is not the case. So, uh, nowadays, science should be celebrated and scientists um, have no problems being, you know, uh, looking after themselves and also being brainy. Brains and beauty can go together hand in hand. On the left is uh, the annual award for L'Oreal Women in Science uh, Award, which is given out to beautiful ladies, sexy ladies, but they're also brainy as hell, uh, ladies who contributed a lot towards science and technology. And on the right here, this is my friend uh, I met in FameLab International. His name is Alex, and he is a rapper. He is a science rapper. He raps about science. So, you know, science should be celebrated and should be treated as something that is cool and not something that is nerdy or geeky or uh, boring. You know? So that's my point. So uh, another colleague of mine uh, has said something that is some very profound and I, I like to quote him here. He said that to develop as a science nation, there needs to be an advocacy for science appreciation, especially in our local media. Science is treated as pop culture. So if you have BIPOC, you know, all the pullouts, all the beautiful nara and chili sauce and whatnot, was to all that about celebrities, the same level of scrutiny, the same level of coverage and so on needs to be about science. So, you know, wh why not have, uh, you know, uh, science scientists and engineers and academicians and researchers be also treated and put on a pedestal as the celebrities. The discovery of black holes or gravitational waves is discussed and appreciated in major talk shows. So, you are the yang Ilofa dengan, dengan Nabil tu? Dia punya show dia tu? Anyone? Meletuk, yes. yes. So, why not kita panggil scientists datang ke meletuk to explain and cerita sedikit. Yeah, Apa salahnya? Kan, yeah, dia balik-balik uh, kalau kalau tak balik-balik datang ke uh, Malaysia hari ini sahaja ke tiga-tiga uh, yang apa? Selamat pagi Malaysia sahaja. Pagi-pagi tak syok ah. Ni kena yang you know during prime time, during uh, relax time baru orang appreciate science. So scientists are made popular and given rockstar status for the younger generation. So it's high time we move on from the cheap entertainment of Instagram celebrities, Insta famous and the little dramas. So these are my science rockstars. Uh, I know you have uh, uh, those differently. Mine is Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, the science guy, Professor Brian Cox, and Micho Kaku. So I follow a lot of their, you know, um, uh, shows and their videos on YouTube, on Twitter, and so on, because they are uh, they should be our heroes as much as our, you know, footballers or celebrities or film stars and, and so on. So at the end of the day, I need you. We need you all to communicate science. Right. <coughs> so that ends the basically the first section of uh, my presentation. Um, in or basically, this is just about the importance of communicating science and the importance of science itself and how science contributes towards nation building and um, towards building a civilization. Actually, so um, before I proceed, just maybe any feedback uh, that anyone may have, or anything they need to clarify and ask. Uh, Silicon. Any question from the floor, Guy? If there's nothing, we can proceed. Okay, let's proceed. So, I need you to communicate science, basically. But communicating science is so scary. So scary. Scary, lah. And that's okay because you are not alone. You are not the one only one who thinks that communicating science is scary, everyone actually feels the same way. In a survey uh, they did in the US a few years ago, 
Here are the top three things that people are most scared by. Number three is their own death. <coughs> Bayangkan, they have uh, two more things they scared more than their own death. Number two is getting fat. And I am getting fat a little bit. And number one, it's public speaking. So communicating signs of public speaking just like we're doing here right now. So people are very, very afraid of uh, public speaking. So, uh, but that's okay. Because I want you to um, think about these three uh, points right here. When you are presenting on stage, or when you are presenting your, you know, uh, your five minute FYP and so on, you are being three things. You're being three persons. The first is you are being an ideologue. What an ideologue means is that this is something very fantastic. Imagine just you standing on stage and putting out voices, putting out sounds from your mouth and looking at the audience, something amazing is happening. One by one, your audience, you are giving your audience a very special gift. And this gift is called an idea. So one by one, your, your, um, your audience, an idea begins to shape in each and every one of their minds just by you moving your mouth and uh, looking at the audience in a certain way. So ideas are very curious things. They're very uh, interesting things because ideas, they shape the worldview and the mindset of people. Right? And they uh, guide and they um, direct and they act as a guidance of how you should view the world. So just by you know, speaking, you can direct people to how they view certain things. So the same way as I am directing you, the same way as I am speaking here right now, I am giving you ideas and ideas of what science communication should be and how we should you know, communicate science and so on. The same, is, uh, the same goes uh, for you uh, as well. So the first of all, you as a presenter, you are an ideologue. You're giving, you give ideas to the people. Secondly, you also have to remember that when you are on stage and presenting, you are a storyteller. So a storyteller, look at, uh, just like this picture right here, in the middle here, look at the storyteller, the Pachi in the purple uh, dress. What is he doing? How is he standing? What are his arms doing? And what is his facial expression? And by doing that, look at the response of the child, the children sitting below. They are looking up to him in amazement. They are believing what he is saying. Because the person telling the story, he is telling it in such a forceful and convicting and convincing uh, manner that he believes it. He is animating himself that, you know, he's, when he's telling the story, he's He's acting, he's performing, he's moving left and right. He, he is not being his usual self. So my point here, my second point here is that when you are presenting, you are becoming a storyteller. A storyteller is not, when you are a storyteller, you are not the same as uh, you in real life. You understand? How do you, how do you speak? How do you stand? How do you walk? the intonation of the voice that you're using, it's all for the purpose of this act of storytelling. So, you know, the, 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 his intonation, the low voice, his facial expression, you know, if he's saying something very sad, he has to accept. If he's saying something very happy, he's, he has to show excitement and so on. That is the, um, the, 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 the way of the storyteller. So when you are a presenter, you are also a storyteller. And number three 
when you are a presenter, you are also a salesman. So what does a salesman do actually? The salesman has to convince the buyer or the customer to buy his product. But the caveat here is that the, the customer has no compulsion whatsoever to buy the product. Customer tak wajib pun beli produk dia. Dia nak beli, dia akan beli. Kalau dia tak beli, you cannot blame the customer at all for not buying the product. So you are the salesman. In this case, um, for example, in your uh, uh, IEEE YP 5 uh, minute uh, FYP, you, your product is you have to convince the audience that your FYP is important and so on. So you have to sell that to the uh, customers and to the audience. So how you are going to pitch, how you are going to sell and uh, promote your product that is going to depend on your skills as a salesman. So always, always, always when I talk about uh, presenting and talk about science communication, it's always these three things that revolve and that we also always have to keep in mind. You are an ideologue in that you are giving ideas, your, your number one task as a presenter, your number one task as a speaker is to give this gift of ideas. You, what you have been, your idea, what you have in mind, you're giving it to the rest of the audience. And number two, you are a storyteller in that you have to really believe that the, the story that you're telling so that your audience will also believe. And number three, you are also a salesman in that you will also have to um, sell your product and that the audience, they have no compulsion to buy your product. And if they don't buy it, it's not their fault, it's ours, right? So um, let's move on to the basic structure of preparing and presenting your, uh, preparing your presentation. I have four basic structures. First of all, is the hook. Second is called the menu. Third is called the dish. And the fourth is the dessert. So let's talk about one by one. The hook, the hook basically is your starting line. When you want to begin your presentation, what is your starting line? You have to begin with a very convincing and interesting and attractive hook because it hooks the attention of the participants or the attention of the audience to your presentation. If you start your presentation with something that is very basic and very monotone and very flat, that's your hook gone. You don't have any hook. So a hook is something, a statement that is, can be provocative, that can be a question, that can be set someone thinking, that can really attract the attention of people. I'll give you an example. The last man on earth sat alone in the room. There was a knock on the door. So you see? So you, you start with, you know, uh, a statement that really gets people thinking, oh, what? Oh, last man on the earth? Yeah. Then suddenly there's a knock on the door. And something along that lines. Do you know what is, and so on. By the end of this talk, three person in the world will have died from pneumonia. So something as, uh, that is sure to grab the attention, that is provocative, that is what you call a hook. So hooks are important because the attention span of the audience, they, is, they can make and break by the hook. So the first impression given by the hook, it can make and break uh, the presentation. So uh, we have to ensure, we have to you know, think really hard that the hook that we give is something that is worth um, retaining the attention for. Secondly, is what we call the menu. So the menu is what we are going to give, we, we, well, we are going to tell the audience what our presentation will be. Now this is, um, this can be subjective. Some people may not agree and that's okay. But 
I think this is important because it will give structure and expectation. Uh, it, it, it helps to, for the audience to manage their expectations if they know what is coming up. So if it's just, uh, you know, if, for example, if you don't have a menu, menu is basically saying um, this presentation, I'm going to give this, 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 and followed by this, 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 this. Uh, and the presentation will be, uh, you know, one hour long or 30 minutes long and so on. So that sets in the mind of the uh, audience that they can expect this, 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 and sets them at ease because they are comfortable listening uh, to the presentation because they know that this will come after this and after this, and by this it will end. So if you don't have all of that, it's, uh, it can be very hard sometimes because the audience, they, they don't know what to expect. You know, uh, it works in, for example, stand-up comedy uh, when you don't know, <laughs> you know, when is it going to end uh, and so on. But in a presentation, it can be a bit um, uh, tiring and daunting if you don't know what to expect. So the menu is basically, you're setting the expectations of the uh, presentation. They are going to do this, followed by this, followed by this, uh, and, and so on, right? So hook, menu. Number three is the dish. The dish is basically the content and the meat of your presentation, uh, basically. So if you have your uh, five-minute FYP, uh, you know, basically what you're going to talk about your topic. Uh. So for the, 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 you know, the introduction, blah, 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 why is it important, blah, 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 this is my methodology, blah, 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 and so on, right? So the dish, uh, I think, is pretty basic. And the fourth is the uh, dessert. So dessert is something that ends with a bang. So the dessert is always sweet. You know, in a meal, the dessert is always sweet. So leave the presentation, leave your audience with something sweet at the end of your presentation. Leave the audience with something that will make them think and linger on that um, presentation. So it, I, I will talk about uh, more about the presentation after this, but a dessert is something that always, always, always um, leaves the audience maybe wanting more, maybe thinking about it long after the presentation has ended. And if it can involve a call to action that can maybe actually uh, involve them going to action, uh, you know, acting on it uh, or something, that's even better. So these are the just four basic structures of uh, giving a presentation, hook, menu, dish, uh, and dessert. Now, I am going to just uh, basically um, share some tips, some, some, some basic one-pointers uh, tips and tricks uh, to help you with your presentation, especially so in a science communication and a technical uh, communication. First of all is choose your words, avoid jargons. What is jargons? You know, have you heard of my jargon? So avoid jargons. Jargons is are technical words. And a study has, uh, I recently found a study that says that people who resort to jargons a lot they are the ones who are really not comfortable with their status, who are really, you know, desperate to impress and, and, and you know, and, and impress people and make people think that they are actually better and they're actually, you know, uh, more smarter than they are. So they tend to use bigger words, big words and bombastic words and jargons. And um, this is also important because in science communication, in technical communication, in your FYP, you are the master, you are the expert in that particular field. And that particular field is full of jargons and full of, you know, um, technical words and big words and so on. So, for example, in my field, you know, you have all this uh, feature extraction, dimensionality reduction, orthogonal matching pursuit, wavelet transform, and all that. So, if you for myself, I am very comfortable using these words because I understand what they are because I work with these words. I use them every day in my career. But you have to understand that other people and the audience, they are not as um, exposed as you in terms of knowing these words. So you, all, you tend 
to forget because you become complacent and you think that you just throw out these words and you assume that people know them. And it happens to the best of us because uh, I have a friend who, you know, who's a fantastic science communicator. Tapi bila dia guna perkataan like, for example, biomarkers, in, in biology, I have no idea what biomarkers are, but dia gunakan uh, perkataan itu in a, you know, in, in a very uh, uh, very casual setting. So, um, that can become problematic. So, choose your words, kalau boleh, avoid jargons. Kalau boleh, twist, guna perkataan ataupun ayat ataupun frasa yang lebih, if you can use phrases that are easier to understand, that would be even better. You can avoid jargons. That's number one. Now, number two is something called audience profiling. So audience profiling is that, here's the thing, we talk and we give our presentation, it's not about what we want to say, but it's always about what the audience wants to hear. Remember this. It's not about what we want to say. It's always about what the audience wants to hear. If we are so obsessed and caught up and you know, uh, full of what we want to say only, we can say anything with blah, 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 blah. And we might, in our head, in our imaginary, in, in our mind, we think that we are the best and we are you know, giving such a fantastic, wonderful speech. But in actual fact, the audience, they are just you know, gaping their mouths and sleeping and they don't understand. So it's always, always important to consider your audience and tailor and tweak our presentation, tweak our language based on the uh, audience uh, level of understanding. So in, for example, in your five minute FYP, well, who will the audience consist of? Are they the general public? Are they university students? Are they school children? If they are university students, are they from the same course? Are they from a different course? Are they lecturers? Uh, who are the judges? Are they lecturers? Which like uh, are they like lecturers in which field? So you have to really do the research and study about this. Uh, actually, I'll give you an example. Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States in the late eighteen hundreds, um, he gave a very memorable and it was the one one of the most famous uh, speeches in history it was called the Gettysburg Address and um, he actually prepared a very long speech for the Gettysburg Address but the day before his speech he asked his assistant to go out to the crowd and try to get a gist uh, and the mood and who the crowd and the demographics of who the crowds will be during the address and the assistant did that and he came back and gave his feedback and Abraham Lincoln actually tweaked his presentation and shortened it. It was only three minutes long and it, when he finally delivered it the next day, it became one of the most famous speeches in history. So the importance of knowing your audience and tweaking your language, your length, your, you know, uh, even your jargon, um, to the audience is very very important and cannot be um, uh, uh, cannot be uh, overstated. So this I have a, another video that I'm going to show you about the importance of speaking to the level of uh, the audience. Let's uh, share. My name is Bobby Castori. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in this video, a science expert is going to explain one the same concept, one concept which is the connectome, to five different levels of audience and see how he tweaks his language and tweaks his, you know, the amount of what he needs to give to each uh, level of audience. Maybe for, you know, the small ones, the, some of the basic ones, he doesn't need to really talk a lot and as compared uh, uh, to the expert one, see, see the difference here. 
Bone is, is it's a kind of newly made up term for describing a kind of neuroscience research where we try to map the brain at a scale that's never been mapped before. Every person here can read with understanding it at some level. Do you know why we're here today? Because we're talking about the Yes, we're going to talk about science. And we're going to talk about a very specific kind of science about people who study brains. Do you know what a brain is? What is it? Definitely. So what we're going to talk about this is something that people study in the brain called the connector. Do you know that your body is made up of really tiny things called cells. Okay, well, there's more cells in the brain, like way more cells than, than all of the stars we can see. <laughs> and so what the connectome is, is we'd like to know where every cell in your brain is and how it talks to every other cell in your brain. That was awesome, Dado. Thank you. Connectome? Connectome. To be honest, I have no idea. That's good. That's a great thing. It's the cell. There are cells in the brain. Those brain cells are connected by wires to each other. Electricity travels down those wires and communicates from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain. And each of those brain cells makes a thousand connections, something like a hundred trillion connections uh, in one brain. In your brain, could I take all of that information and put it inside a computer? Would that computer then be you? Computers, they don't have feelings. They don't have feelings. And I think that's one thing that makes the human race strong. I would say that that map also has your feelings in it. Because here's why your feelings, most neuroscientists think, come from your brain pain. And amazingly, whether you feel happy or sad or angry or scared, that's just brain cells communicating with each other. So I think today we're going to talk about connecting. Do you have you ever heard of that? A connectome? Yeah. No, I, awesome. I don't. Awesome. Good. <laughs> it's a map of all the connections between every neuron in your brain. Uh, um, literally, in a human brain, something like a map of the one quadrillion connections that a hundred billion neurons make with each other. Is this like a, a, a map where that's like an actual visual representation of using microscopy or yes. just data? Wow, well, yeah. I'm understanding more so that it's these, these, the a mapping of the, neuro, the, the circuitry, the pathways between neurons that can lead to evidence of patterns in your brain that are common between different people. We have to use electron microscopes. Mm -hmm. And then what we've been developing are ways to slice the brain into really thin slices, use an electron microscope to take a picture of each slice, and then use computers to put it all back. Imagine that we could get a map of every connection, right? And we knew how neurons fire. Do you think we could put that in a computer, that map, and then therefore that computer should be able to think just like the brain that we extract. Well, the computer only communicates with itself in binary, so it only has two options. It can only ask itself yes or no questions, but a human brain has an infinity of directions that it can go. Neurons are also um, uh, digital, uh, meaning a neuron either fires or it doesn't mm -hmm. fire. So that's either one or zero. Uh, and it's the combination of those ones or zeros that actually produce the 10,000 different answers that you said. It's a large scale attempt to understand the wiring map of the brain. Especially. Yeah, great. I think that it's definitely needed. Huh. Um, understanding the anatomy of the brain is definitely important, but it doesn't necessarily tell us everything about the function. So there is some sort of temporal order from neuron to neuron and region to region that we may not be able to pick up. This is where it gets really crazy. Mm -hmm. Could we simulate that map inside a computer? And would that computer then be thinking like that original brain for which we made the map? I mean, that's not between. Well, maybe a wiring 
diagram is not sufficient to understand the brain. It would be crazy to think that that would be sufficient, actually. If you limit the connectome to be just the wiring diagram without, you know, more information about uh, myelination or wheel cells, correct all types of environmental features that surround the neurons and the cells, then you have an incomplete picture. Right. No, no. Sometimes when people get um, they worry about connectomics. I think what they're actually worrying about is that it's the end of the way that we used to do neuroscience. What do you think about memory? Do you think that there's uh, ways of resolving of the, the substrate of human memories? You know, is it just LCP and LCD? I'm not sure if you had a connectome of a human brain, uh, of an adult human, I would be able to read out memories from them. How do I? Yeah. Uh, Etc. One of the things that we're not doing well as a field is sort of educating and telling people beyond our field the benefits of what we can achieve. And I'm impressed that when you talk to people about something that seems kind of crazy and outlandish and perhaps they hadn't been talking about before, it doesn't take long to come to a kind of change of maybe it's kind of amazing. I mean I do hope that more people talk about brains and what we use brains for and, and the ways that we shouldn't use our brains. So I think this field has the opportunity to make that more real. Okay. The end. So how was that? Did you see Bagamana, the researcher? He talked about the connectome topic in five different languages, in the five different levels. Uh, that is comfortable to each and every one of the audience. So just as a trivia, I mean, uh, for you guys, tahap mana you start paham uh, and tahap mana you dah, eh, aku dah lost it. So what's your level? Doctor? Me? Oh. Uh. <laughs> just have a new role. <laughs> I I I I guess do it lah on each level though. It's just uh, uh, I think the guy college good college student uh it's yeah. like getting uh, uh it was still okay after the college student yeah. one. Uh, yeah, when because yeah. that that lady from neurobiology right. So yeah, yeah, she start yeah. talking about the technical thing. Ah uh, okay fine bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, remember, always remember in your presentations um, that your audience is going to be a mix of uh, all of that. So, um, I, I'm not sure in the five minute uh, FYP who is going to be the judges, but you have to do your research and find out if they are able to comprehend fully, you know, the jargons, the, the words that you are going to use. As a rule of thumb, if you're going to talk about something very basic, just use the, the most basic language, uh, use the five-year-old yeah, yeah. language or maybe the 13-year-old the uh, language uh, that everyone can understand. Eh? Okay, that's, that's good. okay, here is uh, another example of an exercise. Uh, this is called TMI. Uh, TMI, I'm sure you know, for stands for too much information. So imagine I have a, a bottle of water and I have a glass glass and empty glass. So this bottle of water, fill with water, this is me, the presenter. And the glass here is the audience. The audience is thirsty for some water, i.e. content or knowledge. So the presenter, he gives, he pours out the water all the way to the audience and he pours it, pours it, pours it. When the water starts to fill up, the audience, you know, at the beginning, he, the audience can take it. But and then the water it starts to fill and spill from the water. At that moment is what we call TMI or too much information. It's when the uh, presenter is giving too much, too much, too much information, too much things, too much uh, knowledge, too much uh, you know uh, numbers and and jargon and whatnot. That the audience is beginning to lose it. Uh, the audience has lost it. They cannot follow the presentation anymore. So it's very important that we sort of dial back, we become a little more careful in the things that we want to present to the audience. So how this relates to your presentation is that for your presentation, for your five minute FYP, you may have a lot of things that you want to say, but you really have to really consider and pick and choose 
what are the most important things first to say. So you cannot, you only have five minutes. You cannot, it's not a, a but it's not, it's not a full thesis. So you only have five minutes, so you cannot obviously talk about everything. So you have to pick the most important parts and fit that in, in, in a five minutes so that it don't become TMI, so that the water do not spill from the audience glass. Okay. So always, always, always less is more. The point about tadi uh, lah TMI tadi tu. So you have a script. You maybe have you have a um, you know uh, something you're working on. You're practicing, practicing, practicing. So always be prepared to trim down your script and buang here, buang there, buang there, buang there, and so on. Okay, less is always more. Throw out unnecessary elements. Okay, look at this picture. Very clean, very clear. Because we are throwing out all the noise and all the unnecessary elements. Okay, another important part is that you have to be the master of your presentation. After the presentation, there is always and usually a Q&A, question and answer, right? At this time, during, you know, even in Viva, even in FYP presentation, during this time, it is the panel's turn to grill you on the subject. Now, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So you need to be the master of your subject such that you are able to explain the concept from the most, um, you know, hardest level of, um, of expertise, like the connectome guy expert there, all the way to the most basic. So only that will prove that you can understand your subject well enough. So the first uh, rule, even before anything else, you have to know that you master and you understand your topic well enough. What's your topic about? What's your FYP about? Is it something using Arduino? Is it something using you know, uh, simulation? Is it something using uh, robotics, drones, or whatever? So you have to understand what those things are first, understand everything about them. Because during the Q&A, they will ask about this. They are, you have no expectation. They will totally ask the left field question and so on too which you have to anticipate and you have to answer. All right. Now, enough with the content. Um, just allow me to share some body language tips, which um, I, said, uh, uh, I guess is very important for um, presentations. Um, I don't really tend to put this at the forefront of my presentation because I think this is uh, on the side. It is important, but you know, preparing for it is much more uh, important. Body language, you can improve it with a lot of practice. And these are the things that, uh, you know, I can share on the do's and don'ts of body language. So first of all, don't blink too much. Um, when you're nervous, uh, people start uh, blinking like this. And the thing with blinking is that it's very distracting, isn't it? right so instead of blinking what you should do is you have to maintain eye contact for three seconds before moving on to the next audience three seconds moving on here three seconds moving on here and so on so uh, obviously in a webinar it's, you cannot do that so i just look at you uh, at the webinar punya camera all the time but in a real audience setting Hopefully, we can get back to doing a real audience setting soon, inshallah. You have to maintain eye contact and move around, you know. So don't do this, don't do this. Look, look at your audience. Okay? So don't look at all over the place uh, or just focus on one place that is creepy. Don't just look at one person. <laughs> so look at many places, right? But don't look all over the place like this. You are not concentrating well. Number three is don't sway your feet. What is sway? Michael Bublé. Sway. So sway is like this. You're shifting your force, shifting your weight uh, from feet to feet. And people, they tend to do this when they're nervous because uh, when they're nervous, they are very conscious about their weight, very conscious about their 
uh, you know, the, um, which we uh, is is a post on which leg and so on. So they try to shift it. So they move from feet to feet <laughs> like this, sweet. Okay. So what you should do, what you should do instead is that when you're on stage in front of everyone, first thing to remember is to lock your feet into position. Lock, lock it, lock. Okay. Stand up very confidently. Lock your feet into position and address the audience. Okay. You can also walk around if you feel comfortable. So you can walk from stage, from this stage, so on. Some people, they feel better uh, just, um, you know, uh, lock, standing very confidently and presenting. Some people, they like to walk and address this, address this, and so on. Um, number four is something that, unfortunately, I tend to use a lot, but I try to be mindful of that. It's, um, uh, so when you're thinking about new points to say, so you, you use filler words. It's called filler words. Mm, so uh, I, um, I, um, body, uh, uh, so, um, uh, um, uh, 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 so it's also very distracting and it's not a mark of a true presenter, a great presenter. So the alternative option, number four, is silence. So be mindful that every time you want to mm, ah, uh, silence is a better filler. So rather than mm, um, and, and so just be mindful of that. Don't 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 use a um, ah, uh, silence. Because the silence it draws the audience into what you're going to see next. It's suspenseful. It's exciting. It shows that you're serious. So, silence, yeah, okay. Number five is don't fold arms like this or put your arms in your pocket. I see a lot of presentations do this as well because they are, again, because if they're nervous, if they're uncomfortable, um, then there I go again. Um, so if they're nervous or they're uncomfortable, um, this and this is the most vulnerable part of uh, the body. Um, I read in um, one of the books on presentation is that it, it's derived from a human biology in the old days when humans had to fight for against uh, wild animals and so on in the you know Zaman uh, Stone Age and prehistoric age and so on. So um, this shows the sort of like a weakness um, against the. Uh, Animal attacks and so on. Though. So you have to fold. Uh, so people they tend to fold arms in order to protect uh, their palms or put their arms uh, in their pocket, um, the hands in their pocket, in order to not show their palms. But actually, if you are confident, if you're comfortable presenting on stage, you should be comfortable and you should be open about your palms. So keeping your palms open, and this is a tip that I learned from a Toastmaster, keeping your palms open is actually a much better uh, view. It shows openness. It shows that you have nothing to hide as opposed to holding your arms. It seems standoffish. It seems you know, you're, you have something to hide and you're not comfortable and so on. So like this, this is much, much uh, better. Or like this, or just Something like this. Yeah, the thing was important. Don't put it in your pocket or don't fold your arms. Right. Number six is something related to your voice, your tone. So when you're speaking, don't use the same monotone all the time. So like I said, goes back to my point about storytelling. Presentation is storytelling. You're telling a story. You're telling about yourself, about your product, about your, your research, about your experience, and so on. And that experience is exciting. It's suspenseful. It's scary. It's sad. It's, and so on. So every time you talk about a sad moment, every time you talk about a serious moment, you have to change your tone. Talk about seriousness. Lower your tone. Talk in a hushed voice. 
Or when you're something exciting and something fantastic is going on, you need to shout and you need to scream and you need to, you know, make your voice louder. So you have to have these variations in your uh, intonation, right? So vary your intonations. And number seven is that same facial expression. And some people get this, unfortunately, they, you know, even with they talk with a different tone, unfortunately, their face is like this, same facial expression. No, you cannot do that. You have, when you're excited, you have to raise your eyebrows, you have to scream, you have to look excited, scared, angry. So these different body language, these different, you know, things that you can do with your body can complement your content really well. But the content without body language, you know, it become boring. Body language without content, you, well, you're just uh, <laughs> blabbering on stage. So you need both um, elements, actually. Okay, so that's about body language. And um, in addition to those 10 body language tips, I also have another 10 secret tips for a winning presentation. And this is my, my own secret tips after winning uh, FameLab how I won uh, FameLab, just some extra tips uh, that I used when winning, uh, you know, when people ask how I won. The first is that choose a comfortable uh, topic. In, well, in, in FameLab, you can choose any topic you want, basically. So I chose a topic that was comfortable to me. People, they tend to choose a topic that is maybe something too big or something too small. So you need to have a topic that you're comfortable with from the start to finish and you are comfortable with every single aspect of that topic you can confidently talk about uh, no problem so the same goes with your five minute fyp your topic the thing that you're going to say you need to be comfortable with that topic number two in my case i i like to write a script some people they don't need a script some people they can you know um, use points or note cards and they know what they're going to say but in my case i tend to write a script and i advise you all to do scripts as well and from this script write it early you know if your if your presentation if the competition is next month you know today even today start writing a five minute script and from today until next month practice it and keep trimming and editing the script Okay, so if you write it by today, then you have ample time to practice it and, uh, you know, uh, edit and think and think um, what are the elements that you want to improve, you want to add, you want to remove and so on. Number three is don't be too specific. Um, I think this relates to paying back because um, if you talk about something, a topic, like I said, a comfortable topic, if a topic is too small, then you don't really have much room to engage and empathize with the audience because that topic is too specific therefore you are the only expert in that topic and other people they cannot really relate or empathize with that particular topic so the topic it must be broad enough that but focused enough to show that you are the expert in that topic avoid jargons and acronyms um, i've said about jargons in my uh, previous slide but another one is actually acronyms what is acronyms acronyms is um, like for example you know uh, shield shield <laughs> you know the marvel shield or in my field uh, like fpga what is fpga field programmable gate array um, i'm comfortable saying fpga but other people might not know what an fpga is so again, we are so we are so used to using these uh, acronyms uh, that we have no problem speaking, uh, saying, uh, you know, mentioning them in our presentation. But we also always always have to remember that the other part, other participants or the audience or the judges they may not know what FPGA is, and that's not their fault. It's, it's you know they, they just don't know. So to be safe, it's better to use another uh, word or to spell out the acronym altogether. Yeah. Be funny, even self-deprecating. So jokes and humor is always um, uh, plus points. The judges and the audience will always love that. So um, try to add in some jokes 
and you know test out the jokes on your friends or your brother or sister see if it works uh, before you use them on stage um, a, a special kind of joke is self-deprecating jokes self-deprecating is something that humiliates yourself you know oh so me uh, look at me I'm fat and so on so you know uh, that is some uh, is something easier to to do um, number six is utilize props for a surprise factor so as you see as you saw in my presentation early on uh, during my fame lab uh, international presentation so you know i used all this brain i ripped up the brain there's a neural network and then i open up my shirt uh, there's a neural network uh, logo and then i use the pebbles i throw the pebbles everything so i utilized props for the surprise uh, factor and that helps uh, give bonus points for the presentation number seven is so what why so what so what is that the why of your presentation the why of your research and your project is important that has to be that has to matter so if you talk about you know this project and so on uh, it's so great and blah 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 but why does it matter to that audience why does it matter to that judge why why should i care basically so you can keep asking your project keep asking and keep keep um, explaining your project and try to ask yourself why is this project important because blah 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 okay why is blah 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 important because they did it why is that they did important because of and so on you have to keep asking keep asking keep asking keep scrutinizing until you are satisfied with the answer right so i can say that for example uh, image uh, fusion is important why uh, is it uh, important well, image fusion helps to uh, the doctors to uh, get better information. Why is uh, better information? Why is better information important? Well, better information leads to uh, better diagnosis of patients. Okay, why is better diagnosis important? And so on. So you keep asking, you keep asking. Uh, so it helps to you know solve, uh, alleviate uh, sickness and disease in the world. So that's an acceptable level of so what. Okay, so um, refer to point number two, when you write a script and you keep trimming and editing, the things that you trim out, the things that you remove, don't throw them out straight away. Have a separate note that you are going to keep. So all the things that you didn't say in your presentation, you have to keep in a special uh, note. And this note will be you will be using for your Q&A. So, of course, every, obviously, after every presentation, there's going to be Q&A by the panel. So, they are most probably going to ask about something related to the, all the points that you didn't mention. So, one of the reasons I won FameLab 2017 was that I, I kept a, a very special point, a very relevant and special point, and a very impressive point <coughs> that I threw out to the um, panel when they asked during the q and and they were very impressed. And that's one of the reasons I won. Uh, number nine is smile. Seriously, seriously smile. So smile. Um, it, smile, it shows confidence in your presentation. So as I showed in my FameLab uh, International presentation, smile when possible. But when, you know, when you're doing, saying something serious, you show a serious face when you're a maze, you, you, you use a gas face, and so on. And number 10, very, very important, all of this, all the, you know, everything about content, everything about body language, it's useless if we don't practice, practice, practice. Do, when the year that I won a film lab, for one month, I practiced 100 times a day, the speech. 100 times a day. Well, so I must have said the speech around 3,000 times. So by the end of that one month, I was already, uh, you know, uh, already in my, it was already second nature to me, the speech, so I can uh, mention it. Even today, I, I, I still remember the speech. You always take this for granted, but how do you must recognize faces? Well, anyway, the brain can be... So by practicing, 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 it will be lodged in your brain, it will become second nature to you, and they will not have a situation whereby you uh forget or you go blank your mind goes blank on stage 
Na'uzubillah, uh, God forbid. So that is the worst that can happen. Okay, so practice uh, makes more. Practice makes perfect. Right? Um, just a little short note. Um, when you're practicing, so don't just practice by yourself. Uh, bounce off your ideas. Find a friend, find a mentor, find a critique who can critique your points, who can make your uh, thing better, and so on. So in my case, my biggest mentors and critics are my friends, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, Professor Abi Virakumarasivam. Uh, Abi is uh, the world champion of FameLab before my year. So he was in 2016. I was in 2017. He's a professor of genetics at Sunwood University, and he was the former president of uh, YSN. Um, and uh, another one was uh, Encik Kamarul Bahrin Harun. We call him Encik Kem. Uh, you may know him from Astro Awani, so he hosts the Agenda Awani discussion show. Very, very critical person. So, uh, Abi, when I was in the UK uh, attending the Fame Life International, he called me uh, at night uh, in my hotel room. And he called me and he asked me to go line by line my script and he tweaked and he helped to tweak and give uh, feedback on how I can do better and so on. And uh, Kamaru Bahri Harun, check him. Uh, the moment after I won FameLab Malaysia, he came down to congratulate me and said, uh, this is good, but you can do better. And so, he, he, you know, he congratulated me and then he backhanded the compliment with, uh, with Wami saying that he wants me to do even better, actually. So he's not satisfied even with that uh, win. So this is a very nice uh, moment. I stayed together in uh, Agenda Awani. Uh, this was in 2018. A very fantastic time uh, that I will cherish. Okay, so that's the end of basically the tips and tricks of uh, science communication on how you can basically present your communication. And the last part of my session this morning is just a little bit about uh, Fame Lab, uh, the competition. Uh, be before I go again, um, based on the last um, uh, section, any comments or any feedback that any of the audience may have? Um, please, go ahead. Okay, any question from the floor? Guy? Um, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you fight the nervousness of when you are presenting? Even when you are alone, except that you are presenting online, for example, you still have that, uh, you still have that some, some hit Nervousness. Yeah. Okay, how do you fight the nervousness? I wish that there is an easier way or an easier answer. But I think the only you know, answer uh, possible, the only way to fight uh, nervousness is by experience. So in my case, uh, Fame Lab, I attended Fame Lab after years and years of uh, trying to speak on stage and trying to um, you know, do public speaking and debating and um, uh, oratory and so on. I remember the very few, first few times uh, I tried to speak on stage, I was nervous as hell and my hands were shaking and um, it was a very scary, scary, scary moment for me. Uh, but after, you know, picking myself up and trying many, many times, over the years, actually your nervousness, it goes away because you tend to develop a very thick skin that uh, you don't really think about, you know, what's the audience going to think about my, you know, my face, am I too fat, am I too tall, am I too thin, am I too dark, am I too thin, blah, 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 and so on. You start getting comfortable in your own self, in your own body, and you just focus on the uh, content. So the answer to that, I mean, the, the hard answer to that would be to uh, try and try and try again. Even, even for example, in, you know, uh, we, we don't really, if, if, if we don't uh, end up champions of five minute uh, FYP, do not stop there. Try and, you know, um, try to get involved with uh, science communication, public speaking, because that will really help you to become a better person and a better uh, presenter and better communicator. Um, a tip that I can share is actually, uh, it's a tip about um, power posing. Have you heard of power posing? 
Yes, I heard. Uh, yeah, so powerful thing is uh, you can you can search a TED talk about power posing. It's basically if we, um, before giving a presentation, we pose. It, it, it sounds kind of silly, but it works. If we be, before giving a presentation, we pose ourselves like this, like a power pose, like a superhero or like a you know action hero or whatever. Uh, we pose ourselves in a stand that is empowering or that is giving us confidence, and we, you know, um, we 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 make believe that the this pose is giving us this energy and this power and this empowerment for us to uh, confidently go on stage and give our presentation. So the concept is basically like uh, fake it till you make it. So you, we, we fake that confidence, we fake losing that nervousness until you really, really lose the nervousness and you really, really gain the confidence. So yeah, that, that would be my answer. Okay, any other question from the floor? Ah, uh, yes, doctor. Yes. So okay. greetings, doctor. Uh, as for five minute FIP composition, we are required to prepare a static slide and uh, have to do presentation based on that. So on preparing the static slide, they will be like, have to be more informative, but at the same time need to be required all the information to be compiled in the presentation slide itself. So do Dr. Zairoma have any kind of tips on that aspects? Okay, about slides. Um, one of the reason FameLab um, focuses on props and not slides is that they, they FameLab believe that uh, slides are what they call it uh, distracting. Well, not distracting. They're like cheating. <laughs> um, uh, but that's okay. Um, so other competitions they can use uh, slides, no problem. So even I'm using slides. Um, so there's nothing to do with FameLab. So when you talk about slides. Um, we, you cannot have something that is too crowded or too, you know, it has all the information uh, in, 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 in one slide. So I think the best uh, slide would be to have just one figure, but this figure is encompassing everything that you want to see. I know that's very hard to do, but just one figure like this, um, you know, it, it can be a diagram, it can be a, a, a chart or whatever, but that figure gives meaning to everything that you want to see in the presentation. So it's not my style and I don't like if that slide has 10, 100 different things uh, seeing at, at the same time. Even when you're attending your kuliah, your lectures, uh, when your lecturer gives, um, you know, lines upon lines of uh, notes per slide, uh, even that is uh, distracting, isn't it, and very hard to follow. So remember my point about TMI, too much information. Um, the general rule of thumb even for a PowerPoint slide is no more than three or four points per slide. So, um, you know, if you want to have one, two, like, one, two, three, four uh, points. Okay. So three or three or four points. Uh, that's it. But if you have, if you want to have one figure or one diagram, one image, that's even better. That's my opinion. Thank you, doctor. Okay. All right, so let's uh, move on to the last part. So th um, the last part is just uh, me introducing you all to the competition called FameLab. Um, it is actually the world's oldest and biggest um, science communication competition. It started in 2006 in the UK uh, and has since spread to around 30 or more countries uh, worldwide. So Malaysia started its first FameLab in 2015, and I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the finalists, but I did not win. But uh, I did not give up. Uh, I tried again in 2016, 
I did not even become a finalist. Uh, and finally, I tried again in 2017 where I won uh, uh, Fame Lab Malaysia. And uh, being the country champion of Fame Lab, uh, I represented Malaysia in Fame Lab International. So um, I got the chance, the opportunity to go to the UK to participate in Fame Lab International. Um, and you can see how I did. So Fame Lab is basically three minutes. You're given three minutes to talk about any science topic of your choice uh, with the um, condition that the topic is, uh, well, sorry, um, that the three elements most uh, taken into account in Fame Lab is content, uh, clarity, and charisma. So, oops, sorry. So, again, let's just watch a video. Sorry, sorry. Hi, my name is Demet. I'm a lecturer at the Institute of Innovation at Levi Medical Science. Hello, my name is Sarunida uh, Ahmad. I'm from the Department of Science. Hi, I'm David B. Hong Cheng. I'm from the University of Toronto. Hi, I'm Cliff Bicket. I'm from Patakina Barosama. Hi, my name is Bashan. I'm a first year medical student from the University of Taina. Hello, my name is Atia Ali. I'm a PhD student who is in UT. Okay, sorry about that. Are you all still with me? Yes, doctor. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, use this one. So this was a uh, payback in 2017. Um, since then, we've had payback 2018, 19, and uh, 20 as well.
and promotes uh, sains communication di Malaysia ini dah 6 tahun uh, diadakan um, 2018, 2019, uh, 2020 Before me, pada 2016 uh, the, the Malaysian winner, uh, Professor Abi uh, he went on to the international stage and he became world champion um, and I was the winner in 2017, the Malaysian winner So I had to follow in his footsteps to become the world champion on the international stage. So um, saya pergi ke um, JMLab International dekat Cheltenham, dekat United Kingdom. And uh, here's a video of how I did. I think I'll... Yes, doctor. Hi uh, everyone, I'm at the uh, uh, international competition here in Cheltenham and this is the Cheltenham Science Festival and uh, my semi-final was this morning. So saya sampai ke semi-final. So my question for you is, do you want your neural networks to work in the way of the human brain? Well, I, unfortunately, I did not manage to get into the final, but it was an awesome, uh, very valuable experience. All the I met some very wonderful um, friends uh, from uh, other countries, finalists from other countries. And it's such a such a lot of uh, information, new knowledge, uh, which stands me in good stead for the future of uh, my own science communication. So uh, disappointed, yes, but uh, it, it's been an awesome experience. On the same thing. I look forward. Hi, this is good. Hi. This is good. This is good. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at your company. I thought you were looking for some. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was best. He was best. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, Yes, um, as I said, friends from other countries, uh, it was awesome anyway, uh, and I'm looking forward to um, enjoying the rest of my time here. Yeah. Look at uh, all the other uh, tents and presentations and exhibitions and see you soon. Okay, so begitulah uh, pengalaman saya pada 2017 dulu. Walaupun tak menang tapi banyak pengalaman manis yang ditimba. Um, 
yang uh, membantulah dalam kita punya kerjaya sebagai science communicator sebagai seorang scientist. Selain daripada itu, um, hadiah um, FameLab juga dia um, the FameLab Prize also gave me the opportunity and they gave me a chance to visit any research facility in Europe. Um, that was the Eurexcess Prize. And so I chose CERN, of course, in Geneva and Switzerland, um, the European uh, Center for Nuclear Research. Uh, and this is a video of my trip to CERN. Oops. Um, I'm at CERN now, and this is a good visit. And there are a lot of questions. I have to I wonder why they do it and what they do, what's behind it. I am at the single cyclotron. This is the very first uh, particle collider uh, in CERN. This was in 1950s or 60s, 60s actually. So this is the precursor. Um, so the Big Brother to uh, Large Hadron Collider. So, uh, this is the factory where they make all the uh, tubes for the um, Large Hadron Collider. And I've just finished a very interesting presentation by Professor Majid right there. I have a, a better understanding of how uh, the LAC works now and uh, a better appreciation of our physics and science and our community. Hi, uh, everyone. I've just been back from meeting Dr. Alberto Pache. And, um, he basically showed me the uh, computing department at CERN. Uh, after the photons been collided, um, what happens is that a lot of data gets created and there must be a way for the computers to detect that sort of data and obviously to filter out the noise. So that is the job of uh, the computing department actually. And apart from that, um, as you know, the World Wide Web was also discovered, was also invented at CERN. <laughs> and I uh, had the chance to visit the silver farm there and saw the very place where uh, the internet was uh, born, was created. So that's uh, an amazing, so lots of love. Thank you again, your access. It's been an amazing time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, so um, again, wonderful experience and wonderful opportunity afforded to me. And all of this was down to my involvement in Fame Lab. So I have a lot to be thankful. Uh, a lot to be indebted for FameLab and I hope that um, you, everyone here, will also join the competition in the future and it will be as enriching and as, um, you know, uh, uh, rewarding uh, to you as it was to me. In 2018, so 2016, we got our <laughs> first world champion from Malaysia, Prof. Abi, and 2017, I didn't win it. In 2018, our Malaysian champion, uh, Dr. Khairiyah, uh, she went on to uh, Film International and she won it again. So our second world champion, I am sandwiched by two world champions actually. So Dr. 2018 was uh, Dr. Khairiyah. Uh, and then we, uh, the Film Lab in Malaysia continued 2019, 2020. Uh, we recently uh, had Film Lab 2020. So hopefully in 2021, all of you here will be able to uh, participate as well and you know um, experience all the joys and uh, wonder uh, of FameLab as well. So in my case, um, FameLab, it was not just about the competition, it was not just about talking three minutes on stage. Um, I used my experiences uh, and the opportunities from FameLab to promote other science, uh, science communication and science and technology endeavors so I did a robotics workshop with school kids. You know, I, I took a video for uh, promoting science. Uh, I mentored uh, school uh, children on their uh, science communication. Uh, I, I 
participated again. I talked that I, I was at Astro Awani to talk about science. Um, I gave a science workshop uh, for the Academy of Sciences, which was something very daunting, <laughs> very scary, but very privileged as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I also gave a talk uh, on science uh, and mathematics and so on, and all the other things as well. So, you know, this was Painlet for me. Painlet gave me uh, all of these things, and I hope that by participating, you will also uh, be able to enjoy the, the perks and benefits uh, of Painlet, inshallah. So that concludes, and we have come to the end of my presentation. That concludes um, basically everything that uh, I can give you, I can share with you for today. Um, two hours long presentation. <laughs> um, I think uh, all of us are very uh, crack, uh, fatigued uh, at the end. But uh, thank you all so much for listening, and I pass over back to the moderator. Silakan. Thank you very much, Dr. Zaid, uh, for a wonderful and inspiring uh, presentation, as well as uh, while we were watching your videos, they are really inspiring myself and I believe all the participants. So uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, IEEE Young Professionals Malaysia, thanks for accepting our invitation uh, to be the speaker in 5-Minute FYP and to inspire our uh, young participants who will be the future of uh, I triply as well and future of Malaysia and future of science and technology. So uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I hope students uh, have really learned a lot of things. In fact, for me, I have taken a lot of screenshots of uh, your tips and tricks uh, for uh, my presentation improvements as well. And I believe the same the students have been doing too. Uh, so before I conclude, I would like to open up the floor for questions if students have any question with our uh, speaker today. You can just unmute your microphone and can ask directly any question with Dr. Zaid. I hope all the participants are still present here. <laughs> I can see the counting here about 53. Uh, no question. And yeah, yeah. one, I can hear your sound, but with some noise in the background. Uh, no question. I already asked. Uh, yes, yes, please say your question. Dr. Zaid is here. Uh, uh, so, no, no question, sir. Uh, no question. I already asked. Okay, okay. Anyone else have any question? Okay, it seems all of you have uh, pop up everything. I will give you time to digest everything uh, till we meet for our next uh, uh, workshop session. So before we conclude for today, I want all of you to turn on your cameras so that we can take a group photo. And afterward, I will uh, uh, announce some of the announcements. Uh, then you will be fine to go back uh, to your things that you are doing already. So I request to all of you to please turn on your cameras. We are going to take a group photo. Okay, I give uh, maybe 30 seconds to comb up your hairs, uh, put up your scarf if you want, or your glasses. <laughs> and I can see someone is in the car, oh, that's Hazwan. Okay, that's... Okay, still half of the participants have not turned on their cameras. I request to all of you, if we conclude it faster, then you can go early for your lunch, one hour early. <laughs> okay, nice comments are coming, still alive, still here, happy to hear that. Okay, so uh, I believe all of you are ready, almost I can see 60-70% participants have uh, made their cameras ready. Okay, I'm going to capture the first screen. Okay, those of you who have the problem with your cameras, it's okay, no problem. But those of you who have the cameras, please do turn it on. Okay, I'm going to take the first screenshot. So ready, everyone? One, two, three. 
Okay, this is my first screenshot. Uh, hold on, I take another one for the second screen. Everyone ready? One, two. Uh, okay, just a moment. Yeah, I couldn't take it. Okay. Okay, that's our second one. And here goes the last one. Okay, one more photo in a freestyle with the speaker. Everyone, okay, share up. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. And before I conclude, I would like to give one announcement. Dr. Charles has already shared a link in the chat box. Uh, I am going to share it again so that if any of you have missed it out earlier, uh, you can fill up the feedback form. So this feedback form is really important for us uh, in order for us to improve. And for you as well, you will be only able to get your certificate of participation if we receive your uh, feedback. So do fill in up and uh, stay in touch in the WhatsApp group. Uh, with this, I would like to say thank you very much to Dr. Zaid Umar for giving his precious time to us and sharing his inspiring journey of Fame Lab and his experiences. I'm really inspired with you, Dr. Zaid, uh, since I know you, <laughs> especially you are the alumni of Imperial College London, so I'm really a fan of you. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, take care of yourself till we meet next time. So take care, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.